Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time from your busy day to be here with us. The people of the city of New York benefit from the work that we do. I am often reminded of a West African proverb, the drums we beat here today echo tomorrow and far away. Some of the stuff that goes on in this room today will have long lasting effect, not just on homeless New Yorkers, but all who call New York City home. Uh, now, with a welcome, and one of the people who are experts on urban planning, uh, we are privileged to have here with us today the acting chair of the Department of Urban Affairs and Planning for Hunter College of the City University of New York, Professor Kwok. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Roosevelt House. Roosevelt House is the home of Hunter's Public Policy Institute. So it is only fitting that we are about to hear the findings of a study done by Picture of Picture the Homeless and Hunter College Center for Community Planning and Development. This study represents the finest tradition of activist scholarship, where academic, academics partner with community groups to produce useful and actionable results. As an academic, I'm quite familiar with uh, this pattern. In normal research, the academics tend to have a say on what topics to research, what kind of questions to ask. Then they go to the community to look for data. After that, they alone interpret the findings and come up with results and recommendations. This one is different. The questions came from the needs of the community. The research is done by Division of Labor. And the findings, interpretation, and conclusion recommendations are done jointly as well. Today, they are presenting findings to the public. In addition, they're using the opportunity to have representatives from the community to comment and respond to the findings. This is truly uh, a study done from the community and back to the community. I'm really looking forward to the findings. And again, welcome you all. One of the many people, and today he'll be a bit of a button pusher, the way he's been pushing my buttons for a few years. Uh, here in our organization, said so many years ago something to me that it was an offhand flip remark, and it's something that was echoed in the borough president's remarks. When we do the hope count, when the city of New York does the hope count of how many people need homes, why don't they count how many homes there are with our people? And Sam, many years ago, said something very simple. People without homes, Homes without people. Duh. <laughs> I never forgot that. And that's, that's what the borough president was talking about. People without homes, tens of thousands of New Yorkers, people who have aged out of institutions, people who have been kicked out by abusive spouses, people who have been released from detention, people who have been burnt out of their homes, people who have been priced out of their homes, tens of thousands of New Yorkers people without homes. At the same time, nobody in 73 years since the WPA fund funded it, no one had taken the time to count the homes without people. And putting those two together is not rocket science. It really isn't. And some of the organizations represented here today have achieved finding housing for a dozen, a hundred or so people. The city of New York, this megalopolis that draws people from all over the world, that beacon on the hill that attracts people from every corner of the earth, can do what is necessary to put together the people without homes and the homes without people. Not something that is impossible. And it was interesting when the borough president alluded to it. And when we first suggested it, and again, this had not been done since the WPA did it 70-something years ago, when we suggested a count of the vacant properties, there were people, some of them we elected, we elected some of those people who said, no, nah, it can't be done. 
it, it's too expensive. It's too cumbersome. It, it, don't even bother trying. Homeless people, and I have to here say that within Picture of the Homeless, I have met some people who are genius at their craft. You know, the fact that they're homeless means they don't have $1,500 a month for rent. It doesn't mean that they're stupid. You know, I've met people within Picture of the Homeless who are sharp as any of the professors, as any of the preachers, as any of the politicians. Some of the people within Picture of the Homeless have done some fantastic work. The first count, homeless people count, was the first report that was done. And that woke up a few people. And some people even said, no, you, you didn't do it right. You, you didn't count it. You couldn't be, it couldn't be true that there's so many vacant spaces. The city of New York at one point said, there's a 2% vacancy rate. We really don't have room for homeless people. And I think you know one of our past mayors said, here's a one-way ticket to anywhere. That was the answer to homelessness. Here's a one-way ticket to anywhere because we don't have room for you. That city, that beacon city on the hill was a place that some saw as becoming a playground for the rich. You know, step aside, money coming through. Step aside, move out of the way, money coming through. That was the attitude of a great many developers and politicians. And to say that there is enough space that every homeless person in New York City can have a roof over their head and a door that closes behind them and a key in their hand, that was a revolutionary and incredible thing for a bunch of homeless people to say. Instead, on 44th Street, uh, I think it was about a month or so after he was inaugurated, we had New York's billionaire mayor propose a plan that says, here's, here's how I'm going to reduce homelessness by half. And the crowd was applauding. And Tyletha can certainly testify. We were out there on the sidewalk while he was inside with his friends. And he said, here's a plan to end homelessness. We'll give them 100% of their rent the first year. We'll give them 80% of their rent the second year. We'll give them 60% decreasing that way. And everybody stood up and roared. What a wonderful, brilliant idea. The emperor's new clothes are absolutely regal. <laughs> Tyletha, Sam, and a bunch of us were on the sidewalk saying, ah, wait a minute, something stinks here. While they were inside glad-handing, we said, the premise that this is based on is unreal. How many people do you know who have a 20% increase in their income every year? That's the premise that the plan was based on. And homeless people were the only ones who stood up and said, this plan, this plan stinks. It's not going to work. Sure enough, two, three years later, a lot of people went through that program and ended up back in the shelter, back on the streets. So I mentioned that because, as I said, there were some genius people that I've met that picture of the homeless, some of whom are here. Picture of the Homeless has been involved and working to be a voice for homeless New Yorkers for the last 12 years. Founded by homeless people, it is critical that we understand uh, it is a voice for homeless people led by homeless people. And this is the distinction between us and some of the churches and some of the other places. The leaders in Picture of the Homeless, they weren't appointed or they weren't sent or they weren't elected by somebody outside of our community. They are people who are or were homeless. Our board of directors are people who are or were homeless. And that makes us distinct and unique. We're not paid by the city of New York or the state of New York. We are homeless people who understand. And this is, again, not rocket science. Homeless people know how to end homelessness. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of people acknowledge that. But homeless people know how to end homelessness. So. We've organized, starting with the first counts that we did in and around uh, 3rd Avenue. And we went up and down, took pictures, wrote down the addresses, and we found out that there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of buildings and thousands of vacant apartments just within walking distance of our office on 116th Street. This is how we began. We spoke to some city people who told us, again, there was a 2% vacancy rate, which was ridiculous, but they based it on their formula that said, uh, apartment is vacant, is considered vacant, it's on their list only if it was occupied two years earlier. L let that illogic sink in. It's only a vacant apartment if somebody was living in it two years earlier. What that meant is that the building on the corner of 116th Street in Madison, which had been vacant for 28 years, was not a vacant unit according to city statistics because it was not occupied two years earlier. That was the formula they used that told us there's only a two. We, and again, you know. Being the people that we are, we said, wait a minute now, uh, the emperor's new clothes is not so good looking. That, that formula is not something that really he should be wrapping himself in. 
because we understood how stupid that was. And we fought, and we did the count, and we, with the help of the borough president, with the help of community voices, with the help of uh, Make the Road by Walking, with the help of lots of organizations, we did the count, and we did what was necessary. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Antonio Paling, and I will be going over um, kind of the organizing uh, methodology and analytical methodology uh, as to how we got this report completed. We started this uh, project with uh, two main parts, right? Two main focuses. The first part um, was how to uh, create a kind of manual that the city can use to actually do the count over and over and over again. The city was saying that it's impossible to do, it would cost uh, so much money, so we were saying, okay, we could break it down into a format that you can replicate, that you can do over and over again. And the second part was at very, very little cost, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go over how we actually came up with the numbers and the data uh, within the report itself. The first part was obtaining city data um, before we got to narrowing community districts. So uh, we needed to get uh, an idea of the vacant properties within the city. So uh, using the Freedom of Information Law request, we sent out uh, 19, a total of 19 uh, FOILs, uh, as they're called, uh, to 11 different city agencies. Now, uh, from the city, we got uh, barely anything at all. Uh, some city agencies just didn't respond, some refused, right? Um, and the data, some of the data that we managed to collect, um, it was either outdated or didn't really correlate with the other city data that we were, uh, that we were receiving. Now, um, this is all outlined in the report under initial findings. After we got such a, uh, we went through all that problem to try and obtain all that city data, um, we needed to narrow down uh, to get a proper assessment of what we understood uh, was the actual vacant property uh, that the city thinks are, is out there, right? So we wound up with a number of 9,579 vacant buildings and lots. Again, this is just uh, information that was gained through uh, mostly the FOIL acts sent uh, to different city agencies. Um, we then used this number and mapped it using GIS. Um, Hunter College, uh, Angela Tover did an amazing job with some of these aspects that I'm gonna go over. Um, yeah, clap for Angela. So um, we got a rough 10,000 vacant properties that the city says is out there, um, and then we mapped them out across um, all five boroughs, right? Then we had to figure out how we're actually gonna do the count. Um, we chose community districts. We figured um, that's the uh, closest level of government uh, to the people, and also geographically, it kind of works. They're in neat neighborhoods, so they're, they're, it's manageable. We needed to uh, narrow down to see which community districts we would actually count. We did this by focusing on uh, which community districts had the highest highest rate of vacant buildings, the highest rate of vacant lots, and also the highest uh, density of buildings, right? So essentially, the highest rate of vacancies per community district. We came up with a total of 18 community districts um, within uh, three boroughs. Um, we decided to add in uh, Queens and Staten Island so we can encompass the whole city. So all five boroughs were counted um, for this report. Uh, the number came out to seven in Manhattan, seven community districts in Manhattan, three in the Bronx, um, eight in Brooklyn, one in Queens, and one in Staten Island, okay? So we have data, we have maps, we know where we're counting. The next step would be mobilizing volunteers. Um, we did these through a series of tactics. We organized teach-ins, which, uh, which are workshops, um, basically to anyone who would lend an ear, uh, talking about the issue of vacancy and what we plan to do, the fact that we're counting. We went to any event that dealt with housing, any community board, any church that would listen to us, we, we scouted around. Um, also, we targeted um, our constituents, uh, as we say. Uh, we went to shelters, uh, we went to soup kitchens to make sure that the, most, the people mostly affected by the problem are actually taking part and actually doing something about it, okay? Um, so we mobilized um, over the summer close to 295 volunteers to actually get get this count done. Um, mobilizing volunteers, counting vacant spaces. So we got people who are riled up to actually count. We got the maps, we got the community district targets. Then we gotta do, we gotta actually, actually count, right? Uh, so we mobilized uh, volunteers to count on Saturdays uh, throughout the summer, uh, starting in uh, July, in June, I apologize. Um, 
And again, so every Saturday we mobilize groups of volunteers at different locations. We reached out to our ally organization, faith-based uh, institutions, uh, for them to be able to have us there train folks properly um, on how to identify vacant properties, um, what, are, what are folks looking for, making sure that they're not um, identifying partial vacancies. There are no partial vacancies included in this report. This report is solely vacant lots and fully vacant buildings, okay? So we use those as hubs, those locations where within each community district where folks gathered, got trained, and then headed out uh, to count the vacant properties. Um, cool. So we broke up different community districts and transects to make it more manageable for folks to actually count. Okay, so folks were only counting about 10, 15 square blocks each um, on any given Saturday. We have a bunch of uh, folks out there counting in different community districts, bringing back thousands and thousands of surveys of identified vacant buildings and lots, right? So we have tons and tons of paperwork that took over my, half my office the whole summer. Um, we got to turn that into some sort of data, right? All we have is addresses. Um, so we worked uh, with a simple Excel sheet. We, put it, we plugged them all in. Um, we used OASIS, which is a CUNY mapping service. Uh, provided by the Center of Urban Research uh, for the Graduate Center. Simple online, again, an Excel sheet, and then a free map online. We plugged in addresses, um, and we, found, we identified all the vacant buildings and lots. We knew we were on track just because OASIS gives you a link to the New York City Department of Buildings. So when we put in an address um, in any given borough, uh, we looked up the complaint history from the New York City Department of Buildings, and Category 29 complaint, which is vacant and unguarded, kept on popping up, right? So we knew we were, we were on point. We were, we were doing something correct. So all these addresses turned into data on an Excel sheet. We then transferred them into a BBL, which is a block and lot formation, in order to uh, merge it with uh, the Pluto data. Uh, the Pluto data stands for the primary land use tax lot output, uh, which is uh, coordinated by the Department of City Planning. And now this allowed us to have one address uh, with 70 fields of information. So anything from the actual zoning of the uh, property to um, the square footage, right? So that's how we were able, uh, mostly Hunter College did this aspect of merging uh, the addresses that we obtained, uh, merging it with the Pluto data to come up with Excel sheets for each borough, identifying vacant buildings um, in a way that we can uh, then transfer that into number, numbers of potential people housed within all these vacant buildings. Um, lastly, the cost analysis. So um, we counted a third of the city and a third of a year for just approximately $150,000, not the reported millions and millions and millions of dollars that they said it would cost to do, okay? I'm the numbers guy today, I guess. Uh, uh, but don't forget, num uh, numbers are power. And as you see, the city of New York uh, couldn't even get the numbers together when this study started. Uh, and a lot of them were wrong. Um, so it's um, one of, one of uh, our jobs at Hunter was to work with the numbers. And again, I'd like to recognize Angela Tovar, who's sitting here, who did a lot of the work and, and putting the numbers on maps. What I'm gonna do with uh, Kendall is we're gonna go th quickly through the boroughs, mm -hmm. the five boroughs, and talk about the communities and the vacancies and what some of the numbers mean. And again, the numbers are power, so hopefully they can help empower people in communities to do something with the numbers, whether or not the city decides to do its count uh, uh, um, now or in the future, we can own the numbers. People in communities can own the numbers to have a better understanding where vacancies are and, um, and, and develop strategies and plans for dealing with them. So if we can get up. While that's going up, they're generally kind of, if you look at it on a map, there's sort of different clusters of, uh, two different kinds of clusters of vacancies, uh, especially vacant buildings. There are vacant buildings that are there because of abandonment. Uh, landlords have walked away from them. Many of them have been vacant for years. And then there are a lot of buildings uh, in areas that 
you might be surprised at that are very classy areas, very high rent areas. And there are a lot of vac vacancies. So I'm going to point out some of those. Uh, and they're there because, for speculation. Landlords have held units, consciously held units off the market. Uh, they're renting the ground floor. Okay. Uh, um, the ground floor commercial, you saw an example of that before. It's making a killing on, on exorbitant rents. So they prefer to leave the upper floors vacant. They're making enough money on the commercial rents. They feel they don't need to rent it, and they're going to hold on to it until they feel the market's right when they can make a killing on the residential rents. Manhattan, the area with the largest numbers of vacancies, Harlem. The three Harlem community districts, uh, East Harlem, Central Harlem, and Morningside Heights. And then lower Manhattan, uh, you've got Soho, Noho, uh, Tribeca, and Midtown Manhattan. Midtown Manhattan. And there's a lot of those commercial buildings, I mean, with buildings with commercial on the ground floor and the upper floors on very classy commercial streets that are vacant, okay? So now, uh, Kendall. So I'm gonna give you a little of what happened with us when, as far as the volunteers. So Manhattan was the second borough we counted, and we had our press conference on the corner of 115th Street and 3rd Avenue in front of, across the street actually from what Tom was just talking about and what we found rampant in the neighborhood. A building with a commercial space was rented and the apartment building was warehoused. We've learned that a landlord can pay his taxes in the first three months with the rent from the commercial space. The next month is all his other expenses and the last eight months are profit. So he doesn't really need to be, as Owen, as Roger said earlier, he doesn't need to be bothered with tenants because he's already made his money for the year in four months. But in a better world, since a lot of the population going into the shelter system is coming from Central Harlem, Harlem period, in a better world, if the landlord rented out the apartment building, the commercial rent was subsidized the rental for the residential part, and you'd have affordable housing. But as he said, they don't want to be bothered with tenants. So we seem to be a problem because we actually want our services. But, um, <laughs> but um, in Harlem, as I said, that was uh, a large part of what we found. We found a lot of uh, old apartment buildings, brownstones, and so on, and maybe and some. Uh, stalled or completed construction nobody wants. But um, we did have um, the cooperation of and help from our council members, Melissa Marquis Burrito, Margaret Chin, in the Lower East Side, and Jessica Lappin, and our allies in Harlem, our Community Voices Heard, Interfaith Assembly on Homelessness and F Housing, CAB, and Union Theological Seminary where we recruited the largest number of volunteers from the student body. And when they went out and counted Harlem, they were amazed at what was surrounding their school. They had no idea that they were going to school and living in the midst of so much desolation and so much um, poverty. So that's a little bit of what happened with us with Brooklyn. Um, sorry, Manhattan. In each of the boroughs, of course, we didn't count all of the community districts. So the numbers you're hearing are are low ball estimates, really. Uh, there's a lot of, um, we pick the community boards that have the highest concentrations, but outside of that, and in the Bronx, um, the community districts are concentrated in the mid-Bronx. Most likely in the South Bronx and in other community districts, there are going to be many more uh, vacancies. Um, but you see, these are the three community districts that are adjacent to one another. So the Bronx is the borough of shelters. Out of the five boroughs, Bronx has the most shelters in it, and I live in one of them. Um, and we counted the Bronx third. Um, the press conference we had was on Walton Street, a few blocks from the office. And the empty lot we stood in front of could, could 
contain four single homes or one large apartment building. The house directly to the right was vacant and in disrepair. And then a few doors down from the lot, there was another house that was vacant. And uh, the neighbors weren't quite sure what was going to happen with it. Looking at that side of the street, it reminded you of the Fort Apache days of the Bronx when the Bronx was burning. But if you turn around and look on the other side of the street, all the apartment buildings on that side of the street were occupied. Um, the volunteers found the Bronx a little challenging because it's quite hilly. So everybody got to work out trying to get to the hubs and trying to get to do the count. But um, we managed to do it. Um, Bronx also uh, recently was in the newspaper, the Bronx has the highest rate of unemployment in the city. And it has some of the lowest AMIs, which is area median incomes for individual communities in the city. Um, and we wanted to thank the New York Public Library, uh, the Tremont, High Bridge, and West Farms branch. And High Bridge is like trying to climb a mountain because that was my hub. <laughs> Queens. The um, vacancies were concentrated in the far Rockaways, way out there. Um, and you ask why far Rockaway? Well, there are a couple of things happening. There are two large uh, city urban renewal areas that have, been, have had enormous amount of vacant land for years and years. And you have to ask yourself, why haven't they been built on? What are they doing sitting idle? So uh, that's another story. But that um, one of them is the Arvern Urban Renewal Area, and the other is Edgemere over here. And the, the darker circles are the lots, the vacant lots. Uh, but still, there's a significant number of vacant buildings. And because of its location, though, there is a lot of speculation going on in that part of the borough. Uh, there, it's also the largest concentration of public housing in uh, Queens. Okay, it took us a day to get out there. I'm sorry. It's just, it's just a long ride on the A train. Um, we had our co press conference on uh, the commercial strip of Mott Avenue, and in the middle of this hustle bustle uh, block, there was one total building empty. Even the storefront was empty. Um, Queens is the only borough that does not have any shelters. So everything is either concentrated in the Bronx or scattered between Manhattan, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Queens has no shelters. Um, Tom alluded to the lots. The total lot acreage that we counted was 254 acres, and you could fit three Disney Worlds in that at 85 acres each, okay? But instead of doing that, they can turn these lots into parks and playgrounds for the kids out there. Um, as you said, urban renewal and whatever brownfields and stuff need to be cleaned out. And we'd like to thank the Far Rockaway Library System for their assistance. Staten Island, in the southern part of Staten Island, there's a lot of vacant land, but it's uh, wetlands, it's contaminated, it's uh, Fresh Kills landfill and everything. The largest concentration of building vacancies is in the northern part of Staten Island, St. George, um, Richmond Terrace. Um, the Staten Island Ferry comes in over here. And so uh, a lot of these areas uh, once had small industries and even not so small in industries that have shut down. And so there's a, a, a lot of vacant housing, uh, some foreclosed housing. All right, Staten Island took two days. I'm sorry. Um, my uncle used to live out there when he was alive, and train, bus, ferry, come on, you know that's a long trip. Um, as Tom alluded to, the area we counted was the community board with the highest concentration of communities of color, because the other end of the island we know is all white folks, and I have folk, friends and family who live out there. The deindustrialization has also led to the vacant buildings. An example I want to use is we have an ally and friend in the back, Michael Vincent Korea. He's wearing the white shirt with the blue PTH hat on. He's a native Staten Islander. And he took us to his community of Stapleton. And Stapleton used to have the Peels Brewery in it. So when he took us to the side of the Peels Brewery, it's this beautiful, huge lot. And I mean, it looks like somebody's actually tending it because the grass is cut, the trees are taken care of. But Peels left. Peels left, so now the area surrounding it is desolate. There are a lot of large family homes that are vacant. 
um, he makes a joke, a joke that um, when you're so poor you can't bury your dead, there's a problem. Two of the three funeral homes have closed. The third one is barely holding on. Um, most of the stores are closed. So as Tom said, when industry moves, a lot of times the neighborhood goes with it, even if the neighborhood is still there. Um, the volunteers found working in Staten Island easier by car or bus in order to cover the um, area. Our hub for the count was Project Hospitality, which is a family shelter. Project Hospitality is surrounded on all sides by vacant lots, vacant homes, vacant buildings. And it's directly across the street from Staten Island Chamber of Commerce. So as um, Brother Bernard, some of you have seen earlier, he and I were usually hub captains together. As we waited, I literally walked uh, two or three blocks around. And, and at one point, I didn't even have to leave the backyard of Project Hospitality to take most of the pictures I took that day. So I sat there the day waiting for our volunteers to come back. And my brain could not wrap around the fact that you have a family shelter with the lots next to it went from the building nearly to the corner. So you know how many houses or apartment houses were in those blocks. If you sat in the backyard and you looked to the opposite street, even the daycare building was vacant. There was a house directly behind it, boarded up. And then when I really walked, I happened to look over the hedge across the street and discovered Staten Island Chamber of Commerce, which really, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And last, but not least at all, Brooklyn has the largest number of vacancies of any borough, and the one community that has more vacancies per square mile than any other in the city, Bedford-Stuyvesant. All of the neighborhoods are in North Brooklyn, North and Central Brooklyn, uh, that have the highest vacancies and as in Staten Island, as in the other boroughs. No surprise, these are uh, predominantly communities of color and low-income communities. So it's um, uh, Bed-Stuy, uh, Brownsville, uh, Bushwick, and uh, East New York, which is the foreclosure capital in New York City and uh, going down to Red Hook and Sunset Park over uh, on that end. Okay, it's time for me to get on my soapbox because Brooklyn's my home borough. And it's very special because we had to, we started in Brooklyn with the first press conference at my family church, John Wesley United Methodist Church, and we ended in Brooklyn. It took us two days to complete Brooklyn. Um, and that was because there's a high concentration of vacant property, as Tom said, sometimes block after block after block. Um, as he said, Brooklyn is on the fast track of gentrification and foreclosure. I don't recognize some of the neighborhoods I used to be in. Um, the banks have been redlining the community since the 1950s. An example, my family church has been trying since 1954, the year before I was born, to refurbish the church par par parsonage, sorry, that was destroyed by fire. Now the brownstone shell is still standing, but is waiting for a new interior, and they can't get the money. All the buildings along Notion Avenue next to it are empty, with the owner trying to rent the commercial spaces, save the bodega on the corner, but all the apartments are warehoused. On the other side of the church is an empty lot, They've been paying the taxes. The city just recently, after 20, 30 years trying to clarify the ownership of the lot, found out, told the church that they own half the lot, and the other half of the lot's owned by church in the Bronx, which we can't figure out, but that's something else. But unless we come to an agreement, there's gonna be an empty lot next to my church, and the church wants to use it for the, for the kids as a playground. So, um, the largest population going into the homeless shelter system is coming from my neighborhood, Brooklyn in particular. But today we've proven to you that there doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be anybody homeless. Um, there's enough vacant property for all of us to have a home. Yeah. 
there are churches and community groups throughout the city, but particularly in my home borough, who are trying to save their communities from this destruction. You should know that copies of the report will be available to you at the end of today's press conference. And Sam, our button pusher, will also be pushing the buttons so that this will be available online. Uh, by the end of the day today, this report is available online so that you can access it and use it uh, in your data, in your struggle, in your fight for justice. Hello, everybody. Hello. I guess I want to preface my, my remarks by saying this report is a political call to action. Nothing's going to happen with this report unless we do something about it. Y'all hear me? This report is stepping on some very powerful toes, toes that are making tremendous amount of money. Poverty and homelessness is big business. To think in terms of moving that issue, you're going to have to get up and do something about it. And that is my preference. My task is to speak to three findings from the report, and then I'll make some brief comments about those three findings. Number one, New York City vacant properties could house every homeless person and then some. Now, this is a very important thing to take note of because all of us have been conditioned by the propaganda over the years, decades, that we're dealing in a time of scarcity when, in fact, we're dealing in a time where there's abandonment in the midst of abundance. This country has the capacity to produce a prefab house in 45 minutes. It has online empty houses all over the country that are available. So, that, so this report confirms the fact of the possibility of us ending homelessness here in New York. <laughs> Second, there's no need for shelters. Yes, yes. I call them modern day concentration camps. There's no need for shelters. This report proves this in terms of the amount of vacant lots, vacant housing, and again, you, you combine that with the kind of wealth that this country has and its production capacity, there's no need for people to live in shelters. Number three, this report can be replicated cheaply. And the idea that you cannot find out the problem and therefore you cannot find a solution is erroneous. And the re this report proves that that's the case. My comments on those three findings. There's more on that in the report when you get a copy of it. The recommendations from this report are specific and Brother William is going to follow me with some specific steps that can be taken. But picture the homeless realize that this problem of homelessness and the possibility of ending homelessness exists within a larger problem. That is in a, a problem where you have a tremendous concentration of wealth by 1% of the population. Is a, a, a problem where we have an economy that is poverty producing and homeless producing. It is part of a problem that can only be solved if we begin to get together and build a movement, a social movement, in which the picture of the homeless is clearly prepared to spearhead that development. But this is a big problem that we're dealing with. It is connected with all the other social problems. You find me someone that has a problem with homelessness, I'll show you somebody that has a problem with jobs, with health care, with all the other problems. This, kind of, this is a big problem that we're uh, uh, tackling. And it's, again, it requires that we build something big, a big solution to this big problem. The accumulation of wealth 
in this country is abominable and something we got to deal with. But the people who represent that accumulation are very powerful people. They have organization. They have their tentacles all over the place. And if we're going to come to terms with this, we're going to have to do as what's been done in, in history, and that is the building of a social movement, a social movement led by those most affected. I think Picture the Homeless has demonstrated its capability of giving leadership, despite all the stereotypes about homeless and poor people, that, that somehow their problem is self-inflicted, that they, they cannot speak for themselves, they cannot think for themselves, they can't, cannot fight for themselves, that they cannot lead, not only themselves, but they can lead the nation. Yes. There are in these communities, among the homeless population, but among the poor population at large, geniuses, yes. Yes. intellectual, capable people, right here. And it's a shame in a nation like this that we don't mobilize that type of genius and intellectual resource to resolve these problems that we're dealing with. But, I, you know, but as a proud board member of the Pitch of the Homeless, I think we are committed to beginning to wake up this giant and to begin to have the talents and intellectual capabilities realized in a big way to resolve the problems that we have at hand. I'm going to stop here and give the floor over to the next person. Okay, thank you very much. I think important for us at Picture the Homeless and for others throughout um, the city of New York, when visioning how we respond to what we've uh, learned in this study, um, is trying to respond in a way that revisions how we look at housing, uh, as opposed to the priorities today where housing is primarily a commodity to be invested in, um, absent the existence or presence of people. And so, obviously, you, you've heard several times this afternoon that we believe or that we know that housing is a human right. But it's more than a human right. Housing is about people who are part of a community. Housing is part of communities. When you separate, you get LICs uh, investing in properties as simple investments that don't keep people in mind, then you separate properties from communities, and the communities begin to lose its strength and wither. And, you know, I was thinking, we were watching, we're in silly season right now with the Republican primary. <laughs> it's that time again. And I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out what kind of substance I've been getting from watching the debates because sometimes I'm bored and uh, want to see if I can get some entertainment. And so far the substance that I've gotten is that we have one candidate who is exceedingly wealthy but doesn't pay uh, much in taxes. And from a scene we got earlier in the primary, apparently you can't trust women around him. <laughs> then we have an, uh, oh, and then God bless America, we're the greatest nation on earth. Then we have another candidate who is a nutcase, and apparently you can't trust him around women, but God bless America. And we won't talk about the third one. But the point is, if it's true that we're the greatest nation on earth, and if it's grew, true that New York City is the greatest city in the world, it's only true because we made it so. And now it's time to make it so. And there are a lot of ways to do that, looking at the results of this report. But one way I wanted to look at was from uh, the historical success that has happened with um, community land trusts. A model of investing in housing where land is collectively owned by members of the community, both tenants in the trust and other uh, tenants around the neighborhood who have a vested interest in the impact of a community land trust on the neighborhood. Uh, one very uh, famous example here in New York is the community land trust starting, uh, that started in the early 80s down at Cooper Square, um, a very successful model. Today there are over 5,000 uh, residents under community land trust. This model ensures not only that the community that 
has an investment in, in the property and the na neighbors they're with sustain ownership, but it's also a model where uh, they sustain affordability because the residents and the communities, the neighborhood who have mutual interest set up these trusts in order to ensure that people who build on the land, either houses or uh, larger uh, apartment uh, uh, rental units, um, do it in a way that it's for affordable housing and not primarily as an investment. And so people obviously would be investing, the own, you know, they're investing in the house or the building, and it's their property and they're going to want to return on it. But it's, it's, a, it's a compromise between the interest of investment and the interest of community. And so this is, I, I don't want to go into too much more detail because we're running out of time. But this is our primary model that we're beginning to look at at Picture the Homeless. It's worked before, obviously, in New York and in many places across the country. We think it can work again. We are here at Picture the Homeless, have taken, taken on a monumentous task of doing this vacant property count within the five boroughs of New York. You know, and um, with this vacant property count, you know, it took a very huge, a lot, a chunk out of our organizational resources in the form of financial as well as human resources to do this count. And we could not have achieved it without the input from Hunter College and a lot of you people sitting here, volunteer as well. You know, it has also taken on a new dimension you know, to organize and also to ensure that housing for homeless, the poor, and the disenfranchised is a result of this historic count. And don't tell us that we cannot have housing, because at Pitch of the Homeless, we have worked miracles. I don't guarantee you that we will turn water into wine, you know, but we can count vacant properties. And from this vacant property, you know, as they have spoken before about the bill intra 48. So when you leave here, apart from the financial part of it, which I'm going to tell you about, I need you also to call your elected representative to let them know, to let them let intra 48 become a law before we leave here. You know, that is what we need so that we can make the next step. However, you know, I am encouraging you to become a member of our solidarity, to become members of our solidarity, whereby we are asking you to donate a minimum of $113, only 113 You know, why is this? This $113 represents 113,000 adults and children that passed through our shelter system last year. Passed through the, center, the shelter system. That's not to take into account those that are on the bridges, in subway, in some other cavern that we did not get to count just the 113,000 that passed through the shelter system. So your donation of $113 will go a far way in helping us to do the work that we do here at Pitch of the Homeless. You know, um, just to let you know once again that um, we want housing to remain what it is a human right, yes. not a civil right. You know, so on your way out, you can pick up a package with those small envelopes to make your contribution. It can be had from picture the homeless members that will be at the door on your way out. And I once again would like to thank you for being here and help us eliminating homelessness. Thank you. My name is Danabel Palma, and I'm the New York City Council Member in District 18th in the Bronx, and I have the privilege and honor to chair the General Welfare Committee 
in the city council and I'm a sponsor um, of intro 48. So I wholeheartedly support the efforts um, that need to be done to make sure that we can get a bill like that passed um, at, in the city council. The results of this study confirm what many of us already um, knew, that thousands of vacant buildings across the city go unseen, um, go unused each night, while at the same time we know that the population in the, ho the homeless population continues to grow within um, our city. And we need to make sure that we are working in partnership with organizations like Picture the Homeless, with um, the city's administration, the city council, the state elected officials, and the federal government to make sure that, you know, we prioritize um, housing. We prioritize especially low-income housing for, for New Yorkers. and. Um, Moving forward, this study will serve as a wonderful resource um, as we in government look to develop programs to make sure that we are addressing the real need of um, the real needs that the homeless population face um, each and every night. I'm just excited that this information is coming out. I'm, e I'm even more excited that it costs substantially less than they said it would. Um, and that excites me a lot because most of us knew uh, that it would cost much less. And we should not take no for answer on things of this nature. Um, the city council is supposed to be there to listen and accept great ideas. Why they don't, I, I really don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and there's some of us in there who are fighting like myself. Um, Melissa Mark Verito, who, who's representative is here. It's her bill, but uh, I'm very comfortable with the bill being in her hands. If it was someone else, perhaps I might not be as, as comfortable as I am, but she's one of the fighters there. And if you guys can do it, I know we can do it. I just want to say a couple of things. First about Picture the Homeless. This is an organization that does not quit. We did a report together years ago, and then Picture the Homeless did their own report, and then they come back yet again, working with Hunter College to keep making the point that this city is in trouble when you talk about affordable housing, when you talk about a homeless population that is exploding in every borough in this city. And I just want to say that we are all judged by how we treat and help others. Amen. And this city must go back to its original roots, which has always been about helping others. And somehow we have lost our way. We do not, we do not understand in city government anymore that with a little bit of a helping hand, we can take somebody who's on the streets, give them shelter, transition themselves to services, and then a housing unit. And once we do that, we take the pressure off government resources, but more importantly, we give people the dignity they deserve to make a life in New York City. And if this city becomes a city only for the very rich, with enclaves for the poorest of the poor, and no ladder to the middle class, then we have failed miserably. And I just want to say to our City Hall friends, you can think all you want in that ivory tower about what people should think and what people should do. But this top-down attitude has kept too many people in this city down. And what Picture of the Homeless is saying today in issuing this report is we are not going to be silent. We are not going to go quietly. We are not going to accept the fact that people are living on the streets in the greatest city on earth when we can do something about this. So I just wanted to stop by today and really thank Picture the Homeless, thank Hunter for staying and partnering with you. I want to thank my office for volunteering, again, the ones who, who, who really helped and showed up, not because they had to. I didn't tell them to. They wanted to work with Picture the Homeless. And I want to just finally say that this report is going to be very interesting to learn to distill. But this report, if it just stays on the shelf, right, will not have served us well. This is, above all else, a political document. This is a document that you must use to shake up the city's political establishment. This is a document. This is a document that you must take back and you must let people understand that we know what's going down in this town. And if we use this document 
as a political vehicle for fundamental change as it relates to working people and poor people in the city, then we can build a foundation that can shake up what has been a very, very top-down approach to our city. And I, as somebody who was born and raised in Washington Heights and who was sort of brought up with this notion that if you play by the rules, if you somehow get through school and you get a part-time job and you stay away from gangs and guns and all that, that the city is going to make it possible for you to have a little home, have some food, have a couple of dreams realized. That has been the power of New York City. That's why people from all over the world want to come here. But if that dream starts to fall away because we can't give people shelter and food and the basic of human life, then the greatest city on the world will fade away. And that would be the great tragedy. So I want us to get loud and angry. I want us to organize. I want us to not accept this anymore. Let us do that. Thank you, Picture the Homeless, for this very good report. Thank you. Greetings, all. Um, we want to. I want to thank. On behalf, I'm here on behalf of Picture the Homeless. I'm a member of Picture the Homeless, and I'm here on behalf of Picture the Homeless. And I won't be able to uh, acknowledge everybody in name because of the time. But there's about four people I believe I want to acknowledge before talking about the next step. And the next step, I would cause state to you, really. Put your seatbelts on because I'm not the kind of guy that's going to be talking all this hoopla, floopla, and I'll tell you why before I come to the acknowledgement. Because homelessness is a reality, and I seen some very terrible things last night. But before I tell you that, I want to first acknowledge uh, the two people who put their heart into this and made this their pet pee, and that is Kendall Jackman and uh, uh, Andreas. Pauline, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Pauline, they really worked hard to make this count a reality and bring it to fruitation. And uh, I want to thank them very much for doing this, for Picture the Homeless, and for the city of New York and the state of New York and the country of America. <laughs> 